It's my pleasure to uh, welcome to our podium uh, Dr. Sarah Byers. Uh, Sarah is an associate professor of philosophy at Boston College. So happily, uh, a local, uh, local trip made complex by the head of the Charles today. So she did manage to navigate her way through the, I, I find myself always hopelessly lost in Boston. So um, I don't know if that afflicts Boston residents too. But um, in any case, we're, we're very grateful that, uh, that she's here with us. Uh, Professor Byer Byers is an expert in Augustine and Hellenistic philosophy and uh, spoke recently for us at our conference at Yale, uh, actually just last month, and did a wonderful job in presenting on uh, St. Augustine and, uh, and freedom. And so we, we are asking her to reprise an analysis of Augustine, but uh, this time with an emphasis on the common good and she's going to be giving, uh, she gave me, we had a very interesting conversation about the, the talk that she's about to give uh, last month. So I've been looking forward to it uh, ever since then. Um, it didn't immediately strike me as obvious that if you're talking about mercy and punishment, you would talk about stoicism. But I think we're going to learn why that is actually a very important place to begin. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Byers to speak to us on defending the common good, mercy, and punishment from Stoicism to Christianity. Thank you very much, Father Dominic. I'm um, a big supporter of the Thomistic Institute, so I'm very pleased to be here today. Questions about the role of compassion in civic life, and especially in legal contexts, seem particularly germane to us at the beginning of the 21st century. Yet as Martha Nussbaum has reminded us, analysis of the issues involved goes back to the ancient world, with Seneca in particular offering a somewhat sophisticated distinction between mercy and compassion, and seeking to foreground mercy in an account of the worthiness of those who receive it. So Seneca, as you probably know, um, wrote in the first century, and he addresses his on clemency to the young emperor Nero, advocating clemency. Basically, his position is that the Stoics consistently call compassion a morally bad emotion. And Seneca agrees with this, but he adds that there's a virtue called mercy, which is not the same as compassion. So what is clemency according to Seneca? It's a tendency to pardon from or lessen punishment in such a way as to preserve the principles of justice. So I'm going to show some pictures now from a trip that I made to Tunisia to see the remains of Roman Africa. Um, it was a trip at the NEH several years ago. And this is just to give a little bit of the context of the historical period in which Seneca is writing and when he's talking about punishment, the kinds of things he's thinking of. So you may or may not recognize this. This is um, the amphitheater at, or sorry, the Colosseum at El Gem in um, southern Tunisia, and this is where parts of the movie The Gladiator were filmed. And this was the third largest in the empire, in the Roman Empire. So it seated about 40,000 people. And this is um, someone's floor, <laughs> the floor in their home, uh, their dining room floor or their living room floor, and it's an enormous mosaic. It's the Roman version of a carpet, but it's a tile mosaic and it's scenes from gladiatorial combat. And as you can see, um, they do not shy away from depicting the bloodiness of the thing. So down in the lower left corner, you have a man who is being attacked in the face by a cheetah and being held up presumably by the lenista, the man who trains the gladiators. And this is a close up. So this of course is considered sport for the Romans and this is how they punish criminals by um, sentencing them to what they call the hunt, which would be combat with wild animals or combat with other gladiators, which is a different type of event. And these events are going on continuously throughout the year, very, very commonly. And so instead of going to a football game, as we do, you would go to watch people being attacked by wild animals. And that's a political punishment for crime. These are just further examples. This is showing you the religious context to the background of these forms of punishment, that it was originally connected in Greece with offering sacrifices to the gods. So this is um, the god Dionysius, and is showing you that the hunt, which is one of the events 
that was carried out in, the, um, in these games, which was wild animals attacking one another and people watching, kind of like watching National Geographic for us, was originally part of, um, they would sacrifice the animals that were killed, but it just evolved into pure entertainment after a certain amount of time. So again, they love to depict the violence, and um, if you've read Augustine's Confessions, you know that bloodlust is something that he discusses as being part of Roman society. Um, here again, this is more. This is um, like the equivalent of wallpaper in the Roman Empire. This is from um, a side panel in someone's home. And then this is something that you would see going into the front door of the home of a, a wealthy Roman citizen. This is showing that he's a member of a civic fraternity that pays money to buy animals for the games. It pays for the upkeep and capture of animals that are then going to fight in these games in the um, Colosseum or other amphitheaters. All right, so Augustine, turning to Augustine. In the City of God, he claims that his endorsement of compassion is the distinctive feature of his ethics as compared to Stoicism, which regarded compassion as a morally bad species of emotion, as we've just seen. And so what, what is the Stoic theory of the emotions that Seneca is backing and Augustine is engaging with? The Stoics distinguish emotions by their objects. And this is um, Cicero's Tusculan Disputations is actually his touchstone for talking about emotions in the city of God, but he also knows Seneca, as we're going to see. The Stoic theory of emotions actually is, has been much discussed recently in the last 40 years because it is formally similar to the cognitive model of emotional therapy that we have found to be clinically effective for treating things like depression, anxiety, anger management, spousal conflict. So many people have a stereotype of the Stoics on emotions, which is that the emotions think that, uh, sorry, the Stoics think that all emotions are bad and that they have this sort of crude, unsophisticated account of affectivity. Actually, that's not quite true. If you read the Stoics, it's fairly sophisticated. So according to the Stoics, fear is caused by the judgment that something bad will happen. It's a future event that I perceive as bad. Grief is caused by the judgment something bad has happened. Desire results from the belief that something good is to be attained in the future, and joy is caused by the judgment that something good has happened. And these four emotions are genera, and each has its own species emotions, which are about specific kinds of circumstances and objects. So according to the Stoics, what makes emotions good or bad is the truth or the falsity of the judgment. So there are good emotions for the Stoics, contrary to the caricature that you often hear about. So the eupatheiai, or the emotions of the good person, the wise person, the morally good emotions, are based on the true belief that only virtues, moral virtues, are good for us, unequivocally good for us. So the paradigmatic wise person feels precaution at the prospect of doing something morally wrong, and this is the wise person's version of fear. It's called precaution, because this is a true evil. The person experiences rational desire at the prospect of doing a virtuous act in the future, joy reflecting on the attainment of some virtue or the completion of some virtuous act. These are the only kinds of emotions that the sage has, although these are genera and they also have species. There's no grief for the paradigmatic sage and therefore there's no compassion because compassion is a species of grief. A wise person being wise never commits moral evil, and therefore he never experiences any type of grief, including compassion. Compassion is defined as feeling grief at the sorrows of another person. Then, of course, we have the fools, who are the vast majority of people on the planet, according to the Stoics. If I fail to train my thoughts in the truth, I will have morally bad emotions caused by rash and erroneous judgments. For example, I may believe that the loss of a job, the death of relatives, winning the lottery, getting a promotion, and so on are important for my happiness. Emotions caused by these false beliefs are craven fear, exhilaration about frivolous matters, a kind of lust for accidentals, and a grief that hysterically overreacts to things, which are really irrelevant to happiness. All right, so as I already mentioned, this is relevant for compassion because compassion is a species of grief. This means that according to the Stoics, 
compassion should be about something that is strictly speaking indifferent, right? That's not a moral virtue because all of the bad emotions are supposed to be about things that are not really true goods and that's what makes them be bad. So they're about indifferent things as opposed to true goods which are moral virtues. But there's a problem with this Stoic view and their attempt to apply it to the case of compassion. So Augustine criticizes this account because the Stoics do not want the sage to grieve even when others are in true evils. The Stoics need to provide some reason for holding that the sage should not have compassion for someone else's moral failings, and this reason seems to be lacking. So if you think of um, the chorus in Euripides' play Medea, the chorus is lamenting the fact that Medea has killed her own children or she's about to kill her own children. And according to the Stoics, the wise person would not experience any compassion for Medea, for what she's about to do to her own soul by committing this atrocious act. And this is Augustine's critique. He's saying, why not? It's not clear why the Stoics should say that that's not a reasonable emotion. Because according to them, emotions are reasonable if they are about true goods and evils, moral virtue and vice. Now, the Stoics think that they have good reasons, good ethical reasons for saying that compassion is an ethical failure. And so we want to ask, does Augustine do justice to them? Does he actually make an attempt to understand their reasons? And does his advocacy of compassion adequately respond to these Stoic concerns about compassion? So we need to dig a little bit deeper into Seneca to give a fair account of what he says. So clemency for Seneca is an inclination to dispense with rules governing retribution whenever circumstances indicate that the principles of justice have been satisfied, typically that the guilty party has learned his or her lesson. If you think of um, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics Book 5, at the end of the discussion of justice, there's that account of what the decent person does, right, that the decent person recognizes when it's appropriate to pardon people or to give them a lesser punishment. And essentially, this stoic virtue that Seneca's talking about is the same as that. So according to the Stoics, moral reform is the end of punishment rather than simple retribution. And this is how they get their account of clemency. So it's acceptable to remit punishment if the end is attained before the sentence commences or during its duration. It is a lack of virtue to continue punishing after there is evidence that the guilty party has learned the lesson. This would be the passion of anger, a species of the passion of desire. Anger is defined as a desire for revenge in which inflicting suffering is erroneously conceived of as a good by the angry person. Clemency is a sensitivity which recognizes reasons for lightening a sentence. The perpetrator is old and frail and so learns his lesson with a light punishment because he feels it more or repentant, or young and inexperienced, and thus was acting from only partial voluntariness, and hence easily regrets the action. These are examples that Seneca gives. What the Stoics decry is mercy which acts from feelings of pity without regard for justice. Sentimental people want to throw open the doors of prisons and let out the most harmful criminals if once they see them cry, Seneca says. And this is what Seneca calls compassion. Now that the terms are defined this way, clemency looks more attractive than compassion, at least for anyone who, like Augustine, is committed to a virtue ethics in which deviations from justice are conceived of as harmful, both to the person who is treated unjustly and also to the moral character of the one who acts unjustly. Right? So according to virtue ethics theories, if you do something wrong, you are harming yourself in addition to harming other people because you're harming your own rationality by making an irrational choice, you're harming your own soul, your moral character. So if we compare that to what Augustine actually does in the City of God, we can see that he has a fairly nuanced view. He's not just saying the Stoics are mean, they should be more empathetic. <laughs> he does uphold the criteria of justice in mercy, not only in the City of God 9.5, but also in his letters dealing with the punishment of criminals. So this is very interesting. These letters um, by Augustine, the ones that pertain to political theory, have been collected out by Dodaro and Adkins and translated in a volume by Cambridge. So those who are interested in this topic, um, it's worth reading these letters because what happens is Augustine is writing to magistrates, telling them what he thinks they should do because they're Christians. 
And in other cases, people are writing to him just because he's a famous intellectual in North Africa. And he is regarded as being you know, very well educated. So people write to him asking for advice. Some of them are magistrates, some of them are ordinary people. And that's where you see the casuistry that he applies using these notions of justice and mercy. For example, when an amateur admirer of Stoicism writes to Augustine expressing the opinion that criminals should not be subjected to beatings simply because the scars are always a fresh source of shame, Augustine, sorry, the writer is presumably paraphrasing Seneca in one of his softer moments. So Seneca's treatise on clemency is some Stoic material and then an eclectic mix of other things. And at one point, um, he's just kind of making every possible appeal to Nero. So one of the things he says is, oh, um, the scars are shameful, so you shouldn't um, be willing to allow people to be beaten so easily, etc. But that's not really a stoic argument, as Augustine points out. Augustine retorts along more orthodox stoic lines that it is essential, nonetheless, that some punishment be meted out. True, physical torture is abhorrent to our way of thinking. And this is why he did not want to press criminal charges against the suspected instigators of a church burning and looting in his diocese, who would have been subject to torture under investigation. But Augustine insists, nonetheless, that there must be some punishment that is proportionate to the harm caused. For known culprits, Augustine advocates a heavy fine as punishment instead of beating because of compassion. However, he presumably thinks that if this less severe punishment cannot be secured from the magistrate, the full force of the law is preferable to a simple pardon. Recall that this is how Augustine understood his own childhood beatings, which he compared to torture. This is in the beginning of the Confessions. Our ultimate criterion of compassion should not be what the perpetrator of crime finds desirable, but his true, that is his moral interests, Augustine thinks. The compassion that he advocates is therefore highly moralizing and subject to the demands of justice, as is Seneca's clemency. Given Augustine's agreement with Seneca that mercy should be answerable to justice and aim at the moral correction of others, why does he insist on calling it compassion, a term by which Seneca denoted an emotion that shows a lack of consideration for justice? Augustine's disagreement with Seneca is primarily directed at his restricting of clemency to a virtue pertaining to actions, a disposition towards external actions. The problem is, for Augustine, that Senecan clemency is an officious set of deeds without any affective involvement. It has the look of an efficient bureaucrat dispensing aid to anonymous recipients. And Augustine thinks that there's something wrong with this, that this is an incomplete account of what it means to have the virtue of clemency that it's basically it's a virtue of emotion as well as of action. When Augustine says that it would have been much more humane for the Stoics to have praised a feeling of compassion, he is directly responding to Seneca. His point is that Seneca did not go far enough when he said that clemency is a particularly humane virtue. Augustine wants clemency to, do, to be defined as an emotion, a good emotion accompanying a tendency to do good works. He thinks that in this life, the sage will be subject to feelings of this kind even while performing morally appropriate actions. Note that officia here is Ciceronian Latin for stoic catheconta, appropriate actions. So the point is that the basic structure of Augustine's position is stoic. Right? He accepts all the criteria about justice, but he just wants to add an effective dimension to it. Seneca's notion of clemency is being supplemented with an affective dimension, not rejected altogether. Why does he use the term compassion? He thinks it's the only term that the Stoics have for an affect that is concerned with the ills of others. So he's adhering to some elements of a conceptual distinction between two senses of mercy, while denying that one needs stick to the technical Stoic names for particular affects. So conceptually, he largely agrees with Seneca, but he, he doesn't feel bound to use the same language necessarily because he is adding this effective component. Why is it so important to Augustine that we sympathize with the people whom we help? First of all, the Stoics don't offer convincing reason 
for omitting an emotion of clemency from the set of morally good emotions, he thinks. Seneca claims that feeling compassion is bad because it clouds the judgment. But this looks to be a smokescreen, for if the Stoics really thought that feelings necessarily involve clouded judgment, they would not have the class of eupatheiae or good emotions at all. This is Augustine's point when he says that sharing in the sadness of someone else can comply with reason. The other Stoic argument against compassion is that effective clemency is impossible because this would be a kind of grief, and the sage, by definition, can have no grief, as we saw before, since he never does anything morally wrong. But this is actually irrelevant to the question of grief over others' moral failures. So back to the case of Medea that I mentioned earlier. If the Stoic sage cared about virtue for its own sake, the matter of whether a virtue or a vice were one's own or another's would not be a deal breaker. If what distinguishes a good emotion from a bad one is that its object is a true moral good or evil rather than an indifferent thing, it is not clear what is grounding the stipulation that the good or evil must be a good or evil of one's own. Hence, the prohibition on grieving over another person's moral vice looks arbitrary. It is not derived from the distinction between mor moral value and everything else, which is supposed to be the basis for classifying emotions as good or bad. What then is motivating the Stoic prescription against feeling compassion for others' moral failings? Augustine thinks that the Stoics fall into Epicureanism, thereby violating their own principles. Of course, if you know Hellenistic philosophy, you know that the major argument in Hellenistic ethics is that between the Stoics and the Epicureans about the proper goal of human life. And here they are becoming their opponent, essentially. He thinks that the Stoics reason as follows. Most people are morally bad, and their lives are messy because of their own wrongdoing and the vicious behaviors of others around them, which entice them to become worse. Consequently, a sage who opened herself up to being emotionally impacted by others' moral failures would potentially be continually upset. Continually being lacerated by such pains is not an enjoyable, healthy way to live. So the sage's emotion should only be about her own moral states. This will reduce the amount of effective pain that the sage experiences to a negligible amount. So, the Stoics are secret Epicureans. By refusing to make clemency a eupatheia, the Stoics are, in fact, though not officially, advocating a version of Epicurean freedom from the painful emotions of fear and grief. Now, the Stoics, by their own eudaimonism, are not supposed to think that the avoidance of pain and attainment of pleasure are proper goals of ethical action, that would be Epicureanism. They have thereby contradicted their own principles. Second reason why Augustine disagrees with the Stoics about compassion, he wants to allow the physical and social hardships of others, in addition to their moral states, to be the proper objects of compassionate clemency. He follows Cicero in arguing that the Stoics preferred indifference are not merely indifferent to our happiness, but are actually good ontologically and consequently can be good for us, that is, real contributors to human happiness. Think back to the case of the looters and their possible torture. Augustine diverges from the Stoics in his underlying assumption that torture is truly bad for the one being tortured because of the harm done to the body and the accompanying physical pain, and not merely bad because it shows a moral defect in the torture. Corporal punishment is thus something to be feared and sorrowful about, even if it is preferable to no punishment at all. Again, this is similar to Augustine's understanding of his own childhood beatings. We have a parallel case that's described in one of Augustine's letters, or a couple of Augustine's letters. In the year 428, merchants were abducting free people from the African coast and selling them as slaves in other provinces. Augustine says he feels the urgency of working to free these people. If he and the other bishops do not have compassion on them, he worries, then no one else with enough clout to be effective will do so. And yet, he thinks that compassion should extend to the slave traders themselves. He desires that the culprits should not face the possibility of punishment according to the applicable law, since a prescribed beating by whips tipped with lead. Instead, he again advocates a fine. I should say that his concern about the beating with whips tipped with lead is, as he says, because it often leads to death. Right? So it's not that he's, he thinks that all corporal punishment is intrinsically 
wrong or even that the death penalty is, is intrinsically wrong, but he thinks that it's something to be avoided because ills of the body are real ills. The difference between Augustine and the Stoics very clearly lies in Augustine's statement that the trafficking of free people is a real evil that has befallen Africa, one meriting grief. On hearing about the misfortunes of these people, hardly one of us, he says, could restrain his tears. It also lies in Augustine's belief that the use of lead-tipped whips in, on criminals is an evil to be avoided because it can lead to death, the destruction of the body, as I just mentioned. It is the Stoic refusal to call such things bad for the one who suffers them, which prompts Augustine to say that Stoic ethics falls short in its failure to include misericordia or compassion. If Augustine's claim that torture, beating, and kidnapping are to be feared and grieved over is not flowing from Stoic principles, what is its source? Here again, the question of precisely what differentiates Augustine's account from that of the Stoics will be complex. Um, this is not a Stoic, this is Martha Nussbaum, as you may know, at the University of Chicago Law School. Nussbaum has said that part of what motivated the Stoic repudiation of compassion was a respect for persons as dignified agents. Their view was strongly egalitarian and cosmopolitan, she says, being rooted in a conviction that humanity has dignity by virtue of its power of choice, or prohiresis. Compassion fails to give adequate attention to the natural dignity of the person, since it focuses on accidental features of the suffering person's life, on what has happened to someone rather than on his or her rational capacity for moral choice. It is true that the Stoics imply that compassion devalues a human being. The Stoic execration of compassion seems to be rooted in a refusal to identify a person with his or her bad fortune. Seneca speaks of self-congratulating pitiers who are averse to the people they pity. They shrink from contact with the handicapped, the elderly, and the destitute. They insultingly fling their alms while averting their glance. Apparently, such people are repulsed because they make this false identification of bad or repulsive circumstances with bad or repulsive human being. Perversely, these people also like there to be needy people because it provides an opportunity for them to, to look compassionate and to feel proud of themselves for acting compassionately. They do not regard the recipients of their alms as equals, but as inferiors. This stoic point is insightful and again, rather attractive, as was their earlier stipulation that compassion ought not to violate justice. But, the viability of the Stoic attempt to articulate what does constitute human dignity is questionable. So the whole emphasis of Stoicism implies that the dignity of a person resides in her acquired moral character. In Epictetus, for example, the Stoic author who makes extensive use of the notion of prohiresis, which is, according to Nussbaum, that's the locus of human dignity, the term does name a rational power for making moral choices, but it also not uncommonly names the dispositions acquired through the reputed use of this power. Thus, prohiresis has qualities. It is either morally beautiful or morally ugly for the Stoics. More importantly, the power is valuable as instrumental for attaining the right kind of disposition, for becoming beautiful. When the Stoics execrate compassion then, they are not making a choice between identifying someone with her bad fortune and her rationality per se, but a choice between identifying someone with her bad fortune and the way she uses her rationality, that is, her moral character. If you act contrary to virtue, the fact that your action was preceded by assent means that you acted from a failure to reason well, and also that you acted voluntarily. If you persist in making bad choices, you will certainly lack the moral identity which merits admiration. It is by no means clear from what the Stoic sources say that I still owe you respect. It would, moreover, be irrational for me to have solicitude for your moral excellence, given that your state is voluntary. We are lacking in the Stoics a robust account of inalienable dignity that can unfailingly command respect for people simply as human 
and solicitude for their moral good, even when they have voluntarily made themselves bad. So we are lacking an account of dignity that can adequately ground an egalitarian stoic mercy such as Nussbaum wants, I think. So Augustine, again, has sort of a complex relationship to what we've just seen in Seneca about the perverse pitiers. In Augustine, we find the same insight that we do in the Stoics, namely that there is a kind of feeling sorry for unfortunate people that is in fact demeaning and perversely desires the bad fortune of those whom it pities. This is a quotation from his commentary in the Gospel of John. We should not wish people to be wretched so that we may be able to practice works of mercy. If you render service to a wretched person, perhaps you desire to extol yourself before him and wish him to be subject to you because you have benefited him. He was in need, you bestowed. You seemed to yourself greater because you bestowed than he on whom it was bestowed. Wish him instead to be your equal. So the compassionate clemency that Augustine is advocating means to rule out this kind of perverse pitying. But unlike the Stoics, he grounds compassion in a robust account of human dignity, which is probably very familiar to many people in this room. He does this when, with an ontological account of the person that is deeply indebted to Plotinus. This account can explain why it is appropriate to fear or grieve when the goodness of the soul or body is threatened or damaged. The soul is a superior kind of substance, it's immaterial, and its intellect is an image of the mind of God making it immortal. This is all in Plotinus, by the way, it's not a specifically Judeo-Christian idea. This ontological excellence justifies lamentation at the fact that people defile their souls with moral evil. The body has borrowed dignity, given that the intellectual soul forms the body. So it is not irrational to grieve if someone is tortured or their corpse is left to be eaten by birds, nor to fear that these things may happen or to get angry at people who want to do them. Finally, we'll talk briefly about Christianity, just a couple of points. As I just said, all of that material is in Plotinus. I love that stuff about human dignity you can get out of the tradition of Platonism, and specifically Plotinus, who is a synthesis of Platonism and Aristotelianism. So we might ask, what is distinctive about Christianity? Does it have anything distinctive to offer to this whole range of questions? The relevant claims specific to Augustine's Christianity are amplifications of these ontological points. By the manner in which the incarnation was accomplished, he thinks, God showed the goodness of both male and female bodies. Redemption itself was motivated by the beauty of the soul. So the excellence of the body, he thinks, was indicated through the incarnation by the fact that God chose to become incarnate as a male in a female. So the body of Mary and the body of Jesus um, both being indicated to have value as worthy receptacles, according to Augustine. And then redemption itself is motivated by the beauty of the soul. It's very interesting the way that Augustine talks about um, God's love for humans, which many times people want to separate as agape, separate that from eros. The way that Augustine talks about God's love for fallen humans is actually in terms of eros, that God loves the beauty that he sees in the human soul, the excellence of the human intellectual soul, and he desires to purify it and clean it off because it's become defiled through sin. This ontological goodness of the soul and therefore of the body, which is prior to and distinct from acquired moral character, allows Augustine to say that human beings deserve a certain protection and respect regardless of what they have done. Compassion is compatible with and even demanded by the virtue of justice because the ontological excellence of the person merits care and concern. In Augustine's schema then, the, effecti the effectively healthy person ends up looking tougher than the stoic sage because the person is more willing and able to bear affective pain. Clemency is not merely a disposition to do helpful things for others, but also to be sensibly affected by their suffering. Paradoxically, then, the toughness accompanies a general softness toward the condition of others. What prevents this softness from being mere sentimentality, as the Stoics feared, is the same thing that provides a more adequate justification for the clement actions of the sage, 
than Seneca himself had provided. Augustine's ontological account of the human being as good, in which the body is an image of the soul and the soul is an image of God, gives him a way to speak of compassionate clemency as a proportionate and thus just response to bodily and moral afflictions. In Augustine's system, the emotion of compassion is caused by an accurate judgment about the loss of real goods, although he will want to retain a distinction in magnitude between temporal goods and eternal goods or virtues. The properly compassionate person cares more about someone's moral state than their physical state, but should care about their physical state. And I'm just going to end with a couple of more pictures from my um, trip to North Africa, illustrating the difference between the, um, the way that Epictetus talks about the death of children and what you see in Christian culture in, at the time of Augustine. So if you've read Epictetus, you know that one of his recommended therapies for avoiding bad passions is when you kiss your child goodnight, you should say to yourself, he may be dead by the morning. And this is to train yourself in the, according to the Stoics' correct belief, that the death of a child is indifferent to your happiness, that the only thing that matters for your happiness is moral virtue. So a good of fortune like a family member is irrelevant to your happiness. And you need to train yourself in this by constantly reminding yourself and saying, this person might be dead by the morning, this person might move away, um, I might lose my job, but none of it matters. If you look at um, early Christian graves, you find a very different attitude towards the death of children, which is coming from this richer ontological view of the person. So this is not the grave of a child, but this is just an interesting <laughs> grave. Um, it's a depiction of a church, and it says Ecclesia Mater at the top. So the church is our mother. And then it says Valencia in pace. Um, may she rest in peace, Valencia. And it's a depiction of a church building. You see the altar there with the candles on top, three candles. And then the floor has mosaic tiles, just like the floors I was showing you earlier. And this is actually the grave of a child. So at the top, you see the key row indicating that this is a Christian burial. And then it's Beata Maria Crispina, Vixit Anis, eight. So she lived to be eight years old. Mencibus, 10. She was 10 months old, eight years, 10 months. And then Diebus, 24, 24 days. And then the final thing they give is the hours. She lived six hours, dormit in pace. So they count down to the number of hours the child lived. It's rather different from Epictetus. This is um, also saying to our, our most sweet daughter, um, uh, I think it's Alicia, she lived, and then it says, in peace, um, 10 years, eight months, 21 <coughs> days, rest in peace. And then it says the date on which she died, Ides of October. And then finally, this one's rather mutilated, but this is not of a child, but um, it says at the top, it's just a middle-aged man. He was um, 43, you can see on the lower right hand. You can see his age. But at the top, you see the key row again, and the alpha omega on either side of the key row. And you can see in the middle line at the top, it says, pauperum amator, lover of the poor. So um, they're singling out the clement and compassionate disposition of this person, right, as worthy of mentioning on the tombstone. So that's all I have to say, and I'm ready for questions. Thank you, Professor Byers. Hi. As always, very, very stimulating and interesting and edifying. Um, what does he do? Why doesn't he think it's wrong to use death or torture always? So he's very careful and he's very clear about intention and uses it to distinguish suicide from accepting death. He thinks that there's a real good in life, real dignity um, that's assaulted when, when mm -hmm. you harm or destroy life. So how can he, at the end of the day, come around and say, at least in some cases, it's, it's not evil to, or wrong for the government to inflict the death penalty, if, if he speaks to that directly? Right. Um, you're asking only about the death penalty or also about corporal punishment? Torture. Torture, yeah. 
Right. Um, so, I mean, so, yeah, uh, he doesn't have an extended discussion of reasons why. You have to pick it out of what he says. But with regard to the death penalty, for example, when he's writing these letter, letters, he sometimes will say it's better to avoid the death penalty. The reason he gives is that it leaves more time for the person to repent. So it's a circumstantial thing, right? I mean, he's just thinking it has the consequence of giving the person more time to repent. And that's the kind of argument that's easily rebutted because you could also say if someone knows they're going to die, they're more likely to repent. <laughs> Whereas if they have 40 years to hang out in prison with their buddies, maybe, you know, maybe they'll never repent. Maybe they'll just be habituated more and more um, away from the ideal. So he doesn't... Um, he doesn't really explain a lot in detail, but you just can pick that up. I think the reason is that in the Torah, the only principle you have about killing people is that it's wrong to kill an innocent person. And it says very clearly, unlike, you may not kill a human unless he's breaking in on you. So the implication is, if he is breaking in on you, it can be acceptable. So the moral principles he's inherited from Christianity indicate that um, only murder is wrong and not killing per se. And so I don't think he thinks he can challenge that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so if punishment is aimed at moral reformation, moral correction, would the idea be then that, would the idea be then that a, someone who was executed for a capital crime would, by that act, have corrected their soul and, and achieved a kind of moral rectitude by being executed? No, I mean, I think he, he would, I mean, he thinks that it actually will prevent it because they're cutting off time, right? But the, the principal would say, well, the only way that it could would be if it caused the person to repent, if the recognition that they're running out of time in their life causes them. But if the act of repentance is going to change their soul now, the fact that he can kill But the, what about on, on the kind of the level of uh, earthly justice? Not, you know, not divine justice. But right. in other words, would, would the act of being, mur uh, being executed, uh, would it restore the person, in a sense, restore a person to their position in the community? Let me ask a question, if I may. The, um, so yesterday we heard from Justice Gorsuch. Yes. I know that you were there. Uh, and we heard him talk about the judge needing to judge not by um, what he might think is good, but by the written law. Um, and that that should be, you know, even a supreme justice, as he put it, you know. Mm -hmm. We should not trust the supreme justice. So I guess my question is, is there a place for mercy on either the Stoic or the Augustinian or some other um, conception in the, in the polity? Like, wh where is the place, or is this a private virtue or private? Mercy? Yeah, or, or compassion or, no, so, so what we're talking about, in other words, in your talk, yes. 
how should that fit into our understanding of the Commonwealth and the role of someone in, I mean, we, we reserve the function of pardons, for example, to the executive, not to the judiciary, but a judge in imposing a sentence might actually take that into account. And there is a system for that in certain, you know, depending on the way the sentencing works and so forth. Uh, well, I think he thinks that the law should have multiple possible punishments written in as possibilities so that the, the judge in the individual case can exercise judgment in, you know, in lessening or um, choosing the maximum punishment depending on the case. So it's, par it's public life. I mean, it's people in public life have to have this virtue, not just in private life. And um, they have to have also the effective component of it, he thinks, so that they're not just um, bureaucrats dispensing aid, right? Or, or there, it has to be human or a humane system. And, but of course, like as Aristotle says, it's impossible to foresee all the possible circumstances, right? So you cannot spell out in law, I think Augustine agrees with that, you cannot spell out in law every possible type of scenario that would arise. So in some cases, what he recommends in his letters is, you know, there, sometimes there might be more than one way that you can charge the person. And he, he actually advocates charging the person with a crime that has the most appropriate punishment. He's less concerned about whether the action literally falls under that, that law than about the punishment that will follow from charging the person according to various laws. So that's one way to, to try to do it. If the, if the particular crime is, and the law that concerns it is not written with the appropriate ranges of punishments, you just charge them according to a different crime. He doesn't really care about that. He cares about the principle of the matter more than the legalism of it. Yes? Yeah, this, um, this is a capital punishment question. Sure. Um, it, it's not historical, <laughs> although I'm, I'm asking you <laughs> to, 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 to approach it, you know, in light of your expertise, obviously. But um, within, the, within the Catholic world, um, the big debate about uh, uh, capital, the, the, the sort of the, our lack of willingness to, to have the state execute people, mm -hmm. right? You have some uh, who say, no, this is, this is a sign that we've really lost the sense of justice. We've kind of gotten sloppy about human responsibility. And therefore, uh, the death penalty, I guess, I guess one solution to that would be to do the death penalty more, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, the other side of it, uh, it, which is not really a side, it's, it's the, the Pope, but um, is to say, no, there's, there's something quite wrong about the idea of executing people. It's not in keeping with their, with their dignity, which you mentioned, you know. Which, which and for Francis would even, would even, although he hasn't said this officially, I don't believe, um, would even go to life imprisonment, right? And he's pretty clear about, uh, much clearer than John Paul was, that um, to the extent that we get rid of the death penalty, we have, we have come closer to an understanding of the dignity of the human person. Um, it's a pretty big shift, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I was in a discussion with someone and I said, well, we'll think it's discontinuous until Pope Francis says it, and then we'll try to find parts of the tradition that uh, connect to it. Mm -hmm. This was about a week before he said it, you know, he <laughs> changed it. So um, anyway, that's just a, a, a food for thought for you. Right, I mean, I don't think that, I mean, my, the history of thinking about the death penalty really is not a history of asking whether those people have dignity, because I don't think anyone in that tradition who who thinks that the death penalty is acceptable in some circumstances would deny that, that all humans have dignity because they have the image of God. I mean, that is from the very early centuries of Judaism, not, not even just Christianity. So that's not the issue. The issue is whether the person loses their right to participate in society because they remove themselves from the social group, essentially. And we are social animals. So um, then the problem is what, what do you do with a human being who is a social animal, but who is antisocial fundamentally? And that does not seem to be able to be reformed into becoming sociable again. 
And in that case, this is why it, it has been discussed under the rubric of self-defense of the community against the individual. That's not what so, right, yes. So, I mean, I think the problem there is that it, it depends, of course, how you understand the letter of the CDF. Um, it seems to me, I'm not sure what else the phrase um, inadmissible or the word inadmissible could mean except intrinsically evil by its object, to use the Thomistic language. And I think that's just, there's no warrant for that in the earlier tradition. So to say that, to say that that is a development of doctrine um, strains credibility. I mean, if you want to say it's a development of doctrine, you would have to show how it meets Newman's seven nodes of development of doctrine, because he is the author of the theory of development of doctrine. And I, well, it was that, yeah, it was, he instructed the CDF to revise the catechism, and the CDF wrote a letter saying this is a development of doctrine. But there's no argument for how it is a development. It's just an assertion over and over this is a development. So I found it very problematic. Um, I think, I mean, the catechism hasn't been reissued yet, so there is no editio typica. Um, that's new, so it doesn't actually exist yet. We just have a command from the Pope that it be revised such, but it actually is not a thing yet. So we'll see what happens next, I suppose. Um, yes? I just had a question about, um, stemming from the previous question about the use of the word inadmissibility. Uh -huh. I was just wondering, oh, sorry about that. Um, uh, I was just wondering maybe uh, if it wouldn't be possible to say something along the lines of uh, capital punishment, even if morally neutral, simpliciter is uh, morally fraught in its use, such that the church and its liberty chooses not to permit its use, even if it is not intrinsically evil. Yeah, it's morally, I mean, to say that it's morally fraught to the extent that the church has forbid its use, I'm not sure how that would be categorized that makes any sense. I mean, the only thing that the church has the authority to forbid absolutely are concerned is evil. That's a fair point. The term moral virtue seems to imply that there are other kinds of virtues. Aristotle distinguishes between moral and intellectual virtues. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm, I'm sure the subject is, uh, Stoicism is sufficiently complex that my generalization is not going to be completely accurate. But I share the impression that, that there, Stoicism as you present it and then the, the response of Augustine to it, it seems to consist in, in, in some good measure in attempting to elide or combine what would be considered an Aristotle intellectual and moral virtue back into one. And what's referred to, as, in, at least in your talk, as moral virtue seems to have an extremely intellectual or you could say cognitive substance to it. And that, Are you saying for Seneca? Well, I'm, I'm saying I don't know, and you're the expert, but I, I just, I get stoicism, and it just seems that there is an attempt to make, uh, to make moral virtue um, achieve the precision and uh, cognitive status that was reserved in much, in Aristotle for intellectual virtue, so that there's an incredible demandingness on how one relates to for example, this issue of compassion, where Aristotle might have been able to handle that uh, a little bit less uh, uh, pressingly to say that it would be an aspect of moral virtue and therefore of habituation and the government of the passions. And so, in a way, uh, it, it wouldn't necessarily uh, get you into as many difficulties. It seems that Seneca or the Stoics attempt to, to, to place, again, I'm saying intellectual and moral virtue together and uh, I just okay, sort of I think I, I think I've got that, your. You know, if you start with Aristotle, his sure. distinction between moral and intellectual virtue, yes. I see them collapsing in the presentation you gave of Seneca into just moral virtue. Mm, okay, but I but I don't know if that's correct. It's right. sort of I hope to be corrected. Sure, <laughs> <laughs> qualified, qualified. Well, you can correct me if I'm incorrect in my correction of you. <laughs> um, I mean, so for Aristotle, prudence is a virtue that's both intellectual and moral, and then it's through prudence that you have the other virtues, the other moral virtues, which are um, habits of acting, right? So their habits of acting, they have to do with your psychology, um, 
being guided by the intellectual moral virtue of prudence, which is correct judgment in various types of situations, how to apply principles correctly in various types of situations. And then each of the virtues are a domain for some type of situation. So um, then the moral virtues for Aristotle are distinguished as being either about actions or about feelings. So good temper is a moral virtue concerned with feelings of anger. Okay? Um, but generosity is a moral virtue concerned with actions of giving property and receiving property. So the issue for Seneca is that, I mean, th if you fit it into Aristotle's taxonomy, it is part of justice. It is um, epiakeia, which is discussed at the end of book five of the Nicomachean Ethics for Aristotle. And it just seems like Seneca's talking about the same thing, or the Stoics are talking about the same thing, and that's what they call clemency. So the critique of Augustine is that that's true, it is a virtue concerned with actions, but it's also a virtue concerned with feelings and affectivity. So the ability to feel sorry for someone when that's the appropriate reaction to their plight is part of being a virtuous person with regard to other people, is the claim. So I don't think it's that Seneca has a purely intellectual account of it. I think that he has an account of it as a virtue concerned with actions only. And Augustine wants to say it's also a virtue that's concerned with feelings. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's helpful. I guess the only thing that just occurs to me that one could say Aristotle doesn't think that it's much of a virtue that's higher than a moral virtue, whereas Seneca is that there is not something specifically higher. Uh huh. Well, okay, that's, that's interesting. So um, certainly the earlier Stoics talk a lot about contemplating the order in the universe and what are classically intellectual, the higher intellectual virtues for Aristotle. By the time you get to late Roman Stoicism, like Seneca, it's almost completely about ethics, so they rarely talk that way. Yes, and Augustine dislikes that as well, of course, because he, his whole emphasis is that the mind is immaterial, which the Stoics disagree with as well, they, they're materialists. So he certainly thinks that's a shortcoming. Good. Um, I have a question. Um, in, so in the brothers uh, Karamazov, there is the, the trial that Dmitri's in uh, regarding his father's murder, right? Um, and his defense lawyer essentially like appeals to uh, the compassion of uh, the Russian people saying that if we um, condemn this man for a murder that we don't have enough um, evidence for, then we're, we're like taking compassion out of society and that will, that will make us like a, an immoral society. And I'm wondering, is that idea of compassion, is, does, it, does compassion become kind of a leap of faith for a group of people who believe that there like could be something better and we have to kind of put the common good at risk um, in order to achieve something? higher for society, is that, does that fit in with Augustine's idea of compassion? I think um, both Seneca and Augustine would say that's not really a question of compassion, it's a question of justice, because if we don't have enough evidence to, to show that the person is guilty, we shouldn't treat them as guilty. But you're right, if you can't know, right, there may be, it may be the fact that the person did do something that deserves punishment, but, but we just don't have the evidence and we can't get them. So in a sense, since we're not omniscient, there is a, a leap of faith, if you will, right? Um, in order to avoid doing something worse, sometimes you have to risk doing something that may be a mistake. But it would be immoral to treat someone as guilty when they're not, so. But you wouldn't say that that's exactly an instance of compassion? No, because at um, least compassion, the way these people are talking yeah. about it is, or the Augustinian, supplementation to um, Seneca is that you know the person is guilty. You know what's happened. You know that they deserve some type of punishment. Then the question is how much punishment? And can you remit the punishment and not be in conflict with justice? And if you fail to do that, is there something wrong with you in some circumstances? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I kind of honed in on one of the things that you had talked about. I'm a, a therapist by training. And so you had talked a little bit about the Stoic philosophy and that um, the leanings in cognitive therapy currently. And, and we know, like, research is proving, like, these, I mean, 
like evidence-based practices and all these things. And I'm wondering if you're foreseeing any long-term consequences or effects from this very stoic philosophy that we're not experiencing right now. We're getting these short-term benefits from this cognitive therapy. And if like in taking a long view, you know, going from whatever stoic philosophy till now, if there's repercussions that we're not assessing currently. I guess, I guess I'm just thinking about, so when you're doing, if you're doing cognitive therapy, right, you're reframing these thoughts in your head to try to reduce your own suffering. Um, and in the moment, that seems like a highly beneficial thing to reduce our own suffering, but you had talked a little bit about the Epicurean nature of that. So I'm thinking um, if we're a culture of people who are all cognitive reframing to just eliminate our own personal suffering through emotions, and, and that's to our benefit currently, but in the long term, are we reducing our ability to, yeah. Right, okay. Um, so I don't, I mean, I'm not an expert in contemporary cognitive therapy. I have read up on it to some extent. I don't think that the justification for engaging in it is to reduce our suffering of painful emotions. I don't, I don't think it's an Epicurean motivation. I think the idea is that if I have incorrect beliefs about the world, then I will interact with the world in a way that doesn't make sense and then this will just this is part of what's causing me suffering okay is that i have an expectation that's unrealistic or i'm overreacting to situations that are not actually that important so it seems to me that that's basically true um it doesn't mean that cognitive therapy can address every type of psychological problem people have because there are chemical imbalances that that people suffer from Hi. Um, Hi. From what I'm hearing from you, it seems that Augustine is far more reluctant to employ physical punishments, including the death penalty and torture, than later Christian thinkers, including arguably St. Thomas would be. Um, if you think that that's the case, uh, what would you attribute that shift to? That's interesting. Do you, could you give an example from Aquinas? This might just be Aquinas' writing style, but uh, you know, as he talks about the death penalty, he does discuss it in far more of a practical way and talks about how you know, it's actually a good thing. And I, as far as I know, although I'm obviously not you know, wholly well-versed in Aquinas, he doesn't uh, say so much that you, know, you should still feel sorrow and compassion, even if it's the most advisable option. Mm -hmm. And it seems like Augustine is taking a arguably softer approach mm -hmm. to you know, physical punishment and torture and that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, right. I mean, again, not my specialty, Aquinas, but what I have read about the death penalty, I think maybe it is fair to say that his main concern is looking at it from the perspective of society that needs to be protected. And he does talk about when a person makes himself into an animal, essentially, meaning like no longer a, a social animal amongst rational animals, <laughs> um, then that person loses his or her right to be treated um, as an equal with everyone else. I think it is true that Augustine is mainly concerned about the soul of the criminal, and that comes across clearly in his writings. I, I, I mean, I don't think it's true to say Aquinas is not concerned about that, but I think it's just um, perhaps the the work in which Aquinas is dealing with the question, he's dealing with it more from a, as a question of political theory. Augustine is dealing with it more from the point of view of the ethics of the individuals involved. So yes, Augustine's concerned about the, the soul of the criminal. Primarily, he does think that that's the main end of punishment is reform. He does think that it has psychological fallout on the person who uses the death penalty. So, you know, he says often that Christians should go into politics. They should not think that they have to stay out of politics to avoid dirty hands. We have the system of laws in place in the late Roman Empire. We're not going to be able to change all the laws right away. It's not even clear which laws we should change immediately. And that, so Christians who are magistrates are going to have to employ the death penalty sometimes. And he thinks that that's regrettable in the sense that it does, it does cause damage to the person doing it psychologically, even though it's not morally wrong. So, I mean, this is really obvious if, if you think humans are social animals, which Augustine does, and the Stoics emphasize a great deal, that we shouldn't be in a position where we have to be killing each other. <laughs> but in fact, we are. <laughs> 
because people attack us, so then we have to be able to fight, fight them off. And in that case, we end up killing them sometimes. So there's nothing morally wrong with doing that, but there is a toll that it takes. It's just like if you think it's acceptable to, to lie to the Nazis when they knock on your door and ask if you're hiding Jews, you could say, well, it's a loss in human relationships because it's not an authentic relationship anymore. Um, because I'm telling them a falsehood with the intent to deceive. But you might say, well, it's not immoral to do that, but there is, it is a shame that we're in that situation, and this just proves that we're in a dysfunctional environment to begin with, and this is because of original sin. That's the way Augustine will deal with it. I think we can take one last question. Great, thanks very much. Um, so uh, my question is about um, some of your thoughts about Augustine's revision of the Aristotelian taxonomy that you were discussing before, and um, a taxonomy of virtues. Um, so um, you mentioned that in his Moral Virtues, he talks about um, you know the virtues that relate to passions and those that relate to actions. And it seems like in this case um, of compassion, it's it's a virtue that relates to both. So I'm wondering if um, if you see that revision of the Aristotelian taxonomy as, as kind of fundamentally rejecting that distinction? And does it apply in other areas of his taxonomy? Um, yeah, thanks. Let's give our thanks to Dr. Byers.